Hi, I am uh, Ulf uh, Petersen. Uh, I'm a physicist from uh, Roskilde uh, University, and um, here last uh, Thursday, last Thursday I was uh, pretty exciting about the news from OpenAI. So they announced this uh, new model, uh, Open the OpenAI O1 model, and this is the preview version that was then made available for us. And um, so it's, it's a model that should be really good at reasoning. So it says here in the announcement that it would do some uh, time to thinking before it gives the answer. Um, and it can be used to do complicated tasks. And also later down it says here, it's been trained on physics, chemistry, and biology and math problems. And um, so when I read this, I was thinking, okay, um, so let's try and uh, use this model on some uh, unformalized uh, physics problems. So that's some problems that I think is um, uh, challenging for the students because many of the questions they get, they are from the textbook when you're reading a chapter about thermodynamics and then you know what the problem is about. For instance, if you are doing thermodynamics, you, it could be how warm is a hot air balloon and you know that you have just been learning about the ideal gas law, so probably you should use that for your answer um, and things like that. But harder, but you can also be in a course like we have at Roskilde University called um, um, physics problem solving, uh, problem solving in physics. You are giving these open-ended questions and you don't know if you should use classical mechanics or thermodynamics or electrodynamics. So when you get this question, how warm is a hot air balloon? Uh, you need to figure out, uh, okay, there's something with uh, Newtonian dynamics, something with uh, gravity. Um, and then you have to realize that you have to use maybe the ideal gas law to describe the gas inside the, the balloon. And you of course have to do some assumptions that you have to justify. Um, then so that that is uh, a tricky part for the students when they have done that then they need to use all this machinery uh, doing some math moving around with equation estimating the parameters in the equation so that's the second part of it that they are trained a lot on in other courses so i wanted to see if i could give this model an um, unformalized some unformalized physics questions from the experience I've had with these uh, large language models, it's important that you set the scene and explain to the model what kind of answer you want. So here I really wanted to tell it that I wanted to think like a physicist. So everything I just explained about formalizing the problem. Yeah, so let's go in and uh, try it out. So here I opened up ChatGPT. I made an instruction prompt that I'll now copy in. So here is the uh, instruction prompt that I put in and I said things like uh, you are an experienced uh, physicist, you are giving an unformalized uh, physics problem in the form of an open-ended question and then I'm explaining it how I wanted to formalize this question. Um, and so let's put in the first question here. Um, let's say how warm is a hot air balloon and now here it's starting to give its answer it's thinking that's good <laughs> piecing together i don't know what that means and i think we can click here yeah so we can click here and get a little insight to what it's doing uh, so now it's uh, doing this reflection breaking down the forces seems like uh, it's going in the right path already here it's writing something with the ideal gas law something with two temperatures and it seems like it solved it here. There's some balancing of forces here and I can see some ideal gas law popping in. Uh, and it's coming up here with a temperature in the end. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it, I think this is too warm for a hot air balloon. I think it would be more like 60 or 70 degrees. Yeah, so it says here that, okay, there's something with, I didn't even know that, that it's uh, uh, excess safety of material risks. Okay, that was interesting. 
Uh, I, okay, this was not... Uh, okay, that was a good answer, but not perfect. I think this temperature here is a little bit high. So let's try another one. Um, so let's try this question here. Um, how fast should a tumble dryer rotate? And so in this problem, you have to realize that you should uh, balance uh, forces when this tumble dryer is rotating. So you have some centrifugal forces and you have a gravity. So let's see if it can figure that out here. Um, accessing scenarios, mapping out forces. So it has something here with the centrifugal force over here and something with the gravitational force are key. So it seems like it's uh, figuring out it's going in the right direction. And I can already see here that it looks like I'm getting the right equations here. Oh, there's something here. Okay, I think this is accessing slippage. It's introducing something with some angles here. Okay, that seems like it's overcomplicating the problem here. Uh, here's then the answer. To find the optimal rotation speed omega, we need to ensure that the clothes are lifted and tumble effectively without sticking to the drum. That's right. So you want it to get up to the top of the drum and then fall down. That's the hard part. Some of those assumptions, uh, yeah, close, uh, that the drum is a horizontal cylinder rotating about its central axis. That seems reasonable. Uh, clothes inside the drum act as particles sliding along the drum's inner surface. That seems a little uh not the right thing to say because what you really want you want high friction in here so you really want it to yeah stick to the side so you want high friction on the side so that's a little strange thing to say often in physics problems you want it to neglect friction so it it's just putting in uh the common assumption you always have so i think it failed a little bit here and then it says that air resistance is neglected. That's also a little playing it's over safe. So I don't think air resistance is really the exciting thing about this problem. You could also say that I'm uh, not taking color of the clothes into account, but that's not an interesting assumption. I don't think that, okay. And then it says here, the coefficient of friction between the clothes and the drum surface is sufficient to prevent slippage until a certain angle. That's a good assumption. I don't know because that's a little, different from what it said up here. It's like, that's a stupid thing to say. And then it says that gravity has a gravitational acceleration. Yeah. Then it's putting to into here the centrifugal force that looks right and the gravitational force. And here it's, I think this is overcomplicating it a little bit to put in this angle. I would just have it uh, for simplicity, just thinking about at the top of the drum um, but okay, this was the way that it chose to formalize it. A little more the advanced that I have thought of. Um, and then it's writing up the equations. And so here it has this uh, cosine theta, where I would just put in a 1. But otherwise it looks uh, all right. And see, then it's putting in uh, good numbers. 35, uh, yeah, so that's a good diameter. Uh, sorry, a radius. And then there's an angle, 70 degrees, looks fine. And then there's, yeah, I, and it's getting, let's see if it can do the calculation. I am not gonna check all these numbers, but it seems reasonable to have this around 30 rounds per minute. One thing I would say to the student here, why do we have so many digits on your answer here? And um, I think the right answer here would be just to round this off to uh, 30 rounds per minute to give like an, order of magnitude that's what you really want here and not not um, not so four significant digits and oh so actually it's done this here so here it's rounded it up to uh, 30 rounds per minute um and then here now it's doing some discussion on it um where it's uh yeah and let's see so this thing that it did a little strange with the friction Friction between cloth and drum affects the angle which the clothes should begin to tumble. Okay, I have to think about this. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, let's try an, uh, another question. So this time, 
uh, I want to ask it, uh, how much electricity does a fan use? And so here you have to think about um, there, are some param there are some parameters on a fan when it's rotating. You have the diameter of the fan and also how fast it's rotating. So they, those are going to be two variables in there. And then when you have uh, air, uh, then the important thing here is airflow and you have to put energy into uh, flowing the air. And so this is not a problem about electrodynamics, even though it has something with electricity in it. So I think that can make it uh, tricky, maybe. Um, and then you have to realize that when you have air flowing, there's uh, two ways that you uh, can spend energy. And one is from the uh, viscosity when you move a medium, but it can also be that you accelerate it. So you also have a density. And here we have turbulent flow in a fan. So here it's density that's important. And the trick to solve this problem is to use a dimensional analysis to set up uh, these parameters that I mentioned here with the uh, density of air and uh, uh, radius of fan and, and the velocity of the fan, and then see if you can get something that have units of energy. So that's how you should solve this. Okay, so here I've copied in our prompt from before, and this time I'm giving it this question, how much electricity does a fan use? So let's see if we can do this one here. So I think the way to solve this is a dimensional analysis. So let's see what it does. And we can click here to see what it's thinking, mapping out scenario. Uh, so it's thinking about what kind of physics it needs to use. Um, <laughs> ensuring accuracy policy of compliance. I don't know what that is about. Then it's uh, formulating the problem. Yeah, so then I'm con uh, I'm working through a physics problem to determine the electricity power of a fan, considering factors like airflow rate, pressure difference, and system efficiency. Okay, uh, so let's see. It it um, these are things that you want as a physics. You want to simplify it, so you wanna just put in this system efficiency maybe as a factor in the end. Um, but let's see what it's doing. Okay, uh, some mechanical power in the pressure difference in Pascal. And here it's putting in the airflow. Okay, no, 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 no. It's saying the electricity power here is due to the pressure difference between the two sides. So that's not really what's going on here. Uh, so it went off in a wrong direction. Uh, what you really wanted to do here was to think about that you need to move the air and you have some velocity, some kinetic energy you are putting into the air. So in the end, you wanted an equation with the density of air and the velocity of air and so on. Um, so maybe I want to see here, try again. Maybe it's, I don't know if you can do this, but let's see if we can come up with the right answer. Um, uh, but now I think it's just it has to be off in a wrong loop now oh okay that's interesting now it looks like this equation I don't know where it has it from then but there's something I, I don't know okay so here it's put now it's calculating it more like I think I would have done it. So here it has the kinetic energy of the air and they have the mass flow rate. Uh, ah, so that's an efficiency parameter. <laughs> okay, that's overcomplicating it. I would throw that away. Um, then it's substituting in the M. So this is a nice equation that is deriving here with this velocity to the third power, something you typically see in these problems. And then it gets this equation here. I would have this uh, efficiency factor. I would not have included that for the sake of simplicity. And then it's putting in some numbers uh, and putting an efficiency of 50%. That's fine. No problem. Uh, and it's getting, yeah, I, this could be a reasonable value. It looks like it's putting in some numbers. So that's good. Um, yeah, so it seems like in the second go, it got this right. Oh. 
alternative approach is using a dimensional analysis. So this was exactly what I was thinking. So it's also now here trying to do this uh, dimensional analysis. So that's really nice that it did that in the end. So uh, that was a quite interesting little uh, experience here that I think in the first go, it was going in a wrong direction. Um, then I said, try again. Um, and then in the second go, it got in the right direction and or even suggested as an alternative method the way that I thought about solving this. So uh, yeah, so that was a really fun um, experience with this uh, lat made one. So it was, did some good things and some bad things. Exciting. Um, so what I also I also wanted to try and give it this um, physics this prompt instruction prompt uh, that I had and trying to give it a non a f not physicist problem and see if it could say I'm not gonna answer this as a physicist. So let's try that. Okay, so here I have now copied in the um, instruction prompt and in the instruction prompt I've added this here, if if the methods of physics cannot solve the question, then stop and explain why this is not an interesting problem from a physicist perspective. Um, and then I put in the question, here's a question, I'm going to Paris, what should I get for breakfast? So let's see if it um, can realize that this is a really uh, simple case, I want to make it easy for it this the first time, then maybe later we can try something harder. Okay, so here it's thinking, taking a closer look, mapping out. Yeah, okay, four, after four seconds, it realized that uh, this was not a physics question. Maybe I could have done that faster, but um, yeah, that's, that's good. And then here it says, as a physicist, I must note that this question does not pertain to a problem that can be analyzed or solved using the principles of physics. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, so um, I think this was some really exciting uh, uh, tests of seeing what this new model could do. So I think it did overall really well and I really liked the answers and it was impressive how it could derive all these formulas. There was a few places where I think it was um, making some of these assumptions that were not necessary and a little bit of overcomplicating the problems, but in general these were I think minor things and it was really impressive how it could actually find the physics in these things. Um, so I would be really excited to hear your uh, uh, comments or ideas about this and um, yeah and and how we we can use this in the future in an, in an interesting way. Um, of course there is also the danger that students they use this as a, some kind of uh, black box tool just plugging in things. Uh, and not really reading the answer and getting to to try this themselves. So I remember when I remember back to myself as a physics student, I had a lot of fun with these kind of questions and I was thinking up my own um, unformalized physics questions all, all the time and were trying to figure out how to solve them and sometimes they couldn't be solved. But uh, yeah, so that's a fun process that I'm also doing now. Um, and so this thing about coming up with good uh, physics question. That could also be something interesting to see. Can this uh, uh, language model, can that also come up with some interesting physics problems that we have not thought about before? So physics is, physics, physics, <laughs> physics is not only about uh, answering questions, it's also about posing the good questions. So can this model also do that? Uh, that would be exciting to learn a little more about that. Okay, 